Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Content warning for chapter 14. This chapter includes corporal punishment, unhealthy attitudes towards raising children, and mild violence. Listen at your own risk. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 14. Pansy stayed away a fortnight. Then, one afternoon, she came home unexpectedly and alone. She came up from the station in the hired car to which Matherson objected so strongly and found Buster having tea in the nursery with Joyce. He fell upon her with shrieks of joy. He kissed her with sticky lips. He hugged her with jammy hands. Dodie! Darling! Dodie! Loveliest! Sweetest! I'm sure he's grown! Oh, Joyce! Isn't he the most wonderful thing on earth? Is Mr. Matherson downstairs? Joyce asked, practically. And why didn't you let us know you were coming? I didn't know myself till the last minute. Basil is staying on a few days. Pansy rose to her feet. She looked white and tired. I'll ring for some fresh tea, Joyce said, but Pansy stopped her. I don't want any. Oh, where is Violet? She went out with Mr. Ramsden after lunch and hasn't come back. Oh, I suppose you have seen a good deal of him. No, he hasn't been here very much. Joyce answered. He came today because he thought you were home, I think. Pansy looked up. He thought I had come home. Yes, he hardly seemed to believe me when I said you had not, and that I was not expecting you. Joyce averted her eyes. I thought perhaps you had written to him, she added. No. Pansy turned to the door. I'll go and change. Come with me, Buster. But when she got to her room, she sat down as she was, and took the child in her arms. She held him for a long time, listening to his stream of chatter, kissing him, and smoothing his tumbled hair. Then, in the middle of an excited account of a rat he had seen run across the yard, she interrupted ruthlessly. Buster, you will always, always love Dodie, no matter what she does, no matter how wicked she is. Couldn't be wicked, Buster said in solemn reproof. Dodie couldn't be wicked. She kissed him passionately and put him down. Run away now, darling. I'll come and see you again presently. When he had gone, she changed her frock and brushed her hair. To her own eyes, she looked white and tired, but it did not seem to matter. She felt that she had come to the crossroads and to the end of her own endurance. She went downstairs presently and met Violet, and met Violet in the hall. She gave a little squeal of amazement. Pansy! She flew at her and hugged her. When did you come? Why didn't you tell us? Lynn said he was sure you wouldn't. Lynn said he was sure you would be coming home today. Really? I don't see how he could possibly have known. Pansy answered coldly. He's only just left me down the garden. Violet went on. I'll run after him and fetch him back. He'd love to see you. No, uh, please don't. I'm tired. I, I'd much rather he didn't come tonight, Violet. All right. I only thought... Where's Basil? He hasn't come back. He's staying on a few days. And did you have a good time? We went to a lot of theaters and dinners. How lovely! I'll just go and put on decent... I'll just go and put on a decent frock. She ran upstairs, and Pansy went into the drawing room. She stood looking out of the window. I will see him tonight. I will see him... The words beat against her brain ceaselessly. She felt that she could go on... She felt that she could not go on any longer. Bitter jealousy had eaten into her very soul. She had fire in her veins. She heard Violet's voice upstairs calling out to Buster, and she moved over to the writing desk and wrote a little note. I want you. I will try and be in the garden soon after dinner. She did not sign her name. She folded the paper, slipped it into an envelope, and rang the bell for one of the maids. Please tell Gates to take this over to Giselle's. At once, please. Her voice was rather breathless. Tell him to give it to Mr. Ramsden himself. The door closed, and Pansy hid her face in her hands, with a mingled sense of relief and humiliation. She had given up fighting. For the moment, even Buster was forgotten. But everything seemed to go wrong that evening. In the first place, Buster was naughty and refused to go to bed. He was overexcited by his mother's unexpected return and clamored to be allowed to stay up. Not tonight. Tomorrow, darling, Pansy promised with a firmness that surprised Joyce. You shall stay up late tomorrow if you'll go to bed now like a good boy. 
Buster stamped his foot. Stay up tonight, he insisted. He had no belief in promises that were only to be fulfilled at such a very distant date as tomorrow. Stay tonight, Dodie, darling, he pleaded. Pansy was tired and overwrought. During the past fortnight, she had been through a great deal, which she could tell neither Joyce nor Violet, and for the first time in her life, she lost patience with Buster. If Father was here, you wouldn't dare to argue, she told him sharply. If you did, you know what would happen. Buster looked faintly amazed at first, then, Don't care, he said rebelliously. Pansy flushed sensitively. If you say that again, I shall punish you, she threatened. She had never punished him in her life, unless a mild scolding could be called punishment. And Buster had no faith in the threat, so he therefore repeated his offense. Don't care at all, he said, and Pansy slapped him. It was only a little slap on his chubby hand, and at first sheer amazement kept him dumb. Then he burst into a roar of such bitter distress that it brought Pansy to her knees at once. I, I didn't hurt you, Buster. You know I didn't, she bleated. It was only a tiny, tiny little slap. Kiss Dodie and say you'll be good. But Buster would have none of her. Hey, you! Hey, you! He screamed. He was cut to the quick by what he considered his mother's heartless treatment. He had not minded the slap at all. They were often indiscriminately bestowed on him by Matherson. But to think that the adored Dodie should have deliberately hit him was more than he could stand. He turned away from her, the tears pouring down his face, his mouth wide open, and he held... He turned away from her, the tears pouring down his face, his mouth wide open, as he held pathetic arms to Joyce. Pansy rose to her feet. You're a naughty little boy, she said. I shall go away and leave you. Buster was past caring. He was still sobbing in Joyce's arms when Pansy walked out of the room. She went downstairs and was met by one of the maids with the news that the cook was sorry, but as they had not expected Mrs. Matherson and Miss Violet had said she would not be in that evening, dinner would be an hour late. Pansy stood still. I, I don't want any dinner, she began to say, and then stopped. She would have to behave normally, she knew, even though her heart was on fire. Very well, she answered. She went into Violet. Where are you going tonight? She asked. Violet looked up. I? Going? Nowhere. Why? Mary has just told me that you said you shouldn't be in to dinner. Oh, that? Violet flushed and her eyes fell. As a matter of fact, Lynn was going to take me for a drive, and I thought we should be out late, but he came over this afternoon and put me off, as he said he'd got a man coming down on business. That's all. That was all. It was enough, more than enough, Pansy thought, and turned away to, ch to check the hasty retort that rose to her lips. She guessed that Violet had been in Lynn's company for a part of each day during her absence, and she was terrified by the sudden antagonism in her heart against her sister. It was nearly nine before dinner was at an end, and then, just as Pansy was beginning to hope for freedom, the vicar called. Pansy liked the vicar very much indeed, but tonight, try as she would, she could not keep impatience from her manner when she went she could not keep impatience from her manner when she went into the drawing room. He apologized profusely for calling at such a late hour. But I heard you were home, and, as I was passing quite near, I thought I must call in and see how you are. I am Quite well, thank you, Pansy answered quickly, and saw that he did not believe it. He stayed half an hour, and then, as Pansy was going to her room, Joyce came to her. I'm so sorry, but Buster won't go to sleep. He wants you to say good night to him. She looked at Pansy appealingly. He really didn't mean to be naughty, she pleaded. It was only that he was so pleased and excited to have you home. The tears rushed to Pansy's eyes. Oh, I know, I know. I was horrid, she answered. I'll come at once. It was all my fault, but my head aches, and everything seems to get on my nerves tonight. I should go to bed and stay there all day tomorrow, Joyce said practically. London's been too much for you. The heat was dreadful, Pansy admitted. She was leaving the room when Joyce stopped her. Pansy, I hate to seem inquisitive, but there isn't anything the matter, is there? The matter? Pansy repeated dully. I mean, you don't look well. And I only thought I wondered, as Mr. Matherson hasn't come back, she broke off apologetically. I'd never tell a soul you know that. If you'd like to, well, to confide in me, she faltered. I know it does one good to be able to talk to someone about things. Pansy squeezed her hand. You're a dear, and thank you, but there isn't anything, at least nothing worse than usual, she said with a strange little laugh, and went on to Buster's room. Joyce did not follow. 
She felt very unhappy. Her shrewd eyes had seen the trouble in Pansy's face, and she had also recognized what Violet had not. Lynn Ramston's restless unhappiness during the past week. If only I could do something to help her, she thought. She owed so much to Pansy, and loved her so much. Presently, Pansy joined her on the landing. He's all right now. He's forgiven me, she said. I was a pig to him, I know. That's absurd, Joyce answered crossly. You're always too kind to everyone. That's your trouble. You look worn out. Do go to bed and let me, let me bring you something to make you sleep. Pansy laughed. <laughs> sleep, I couldn't. I'm not a bit tired. She passed her quickly and went to her own room, and left dreading more questions, shutting and locking the door with trembling hands. It was past ten now and quite dark outside. She pulled aside the blind and looked down into the garden. The warm, still silence seemed to envelop her like a living, breathing presence, and suddenly fear struck at her heart. She was doing a wicked thing. She had no right to have sent that note to Lynn. She could not help loving him, but she could help deliberately meeting him as she meant to now. It was wrong. The whole world would cry shame on her if it knew. I've no right to go. I'm wicked. I've no right to go, she told herself as she unlocked the door and crept down the stairs. From the drawing room, she could hear Violet playing a love song, and for a moment she hesitated. Then she went on and out into the garden. I'll just see if he's there and come back. So she deceived herself as she crossed the soft grass. I didn't stay, and probably he won't be there at all, as Violet said he had a man coming to see him on business. Once she stopped to listen, but there was no sound anywhere save the faint, sentimental strains of the love song Violet was playing, and they gradually died away till the absolute stillness of the night was unbroken, and for a moment Pansy stopped with an appalling sense of loneliness. Supposing Lynn had not come because he no longer wished to. Supposing Violet had taken her place in his heart. <sighs> she looked back at the big house behind her with its lighted windows. She felt herself to be a prisoner within its walls. And it was her own fault. She could blame no living soul for the tragedy that had overtaken her. She had married Matherson with her eyes open and of her own free will. She had married him for his money. With her own hand, she had... She had locked the door on happiness and thrown away the key. And then as she stood there, a tall shadow came between her and the lighted windows of the house. A voice, agitated and broken with emotion, spoke her name. Pansy! And with a little choking cry, she stumbled forward into Lynn Ramston's arms. Lynn! Oh, Lynn! She clung to him, sobbing tearlessly. She had tortured herself with so many doubts and fears that the reaction was more than she could bear. I thought you wouldn't come. I thought you didn't want me any more. I've been so miserable I couldn't bear it any longer. This last week, oh, Lynn, what can I do? What can I do? She hardly knew what she was saying. She was shaking from head to foot. He forgot himself in her distress. He held her to his heart, soothing her tenderly. I've suffered too, my darling. You'll never know why. You'll never know. I've, I've wanted you every minute. I love you with all my soul. I came as soon as I could. I only got your note an hour ago. I had to walk. I thought if I brought the car, somebody might see me and wonder. I love you, Pansy. I love you. I love you. I thought you'd grown tired. It's been so dreadful. It seemed, it seemed so long. He laughed, a little shaken laugh. <laughs> How do you think it's been to me, then, all these years? But you haven't loved me like this always, she whispered. Haven't I? I've tried not to, and I might as well have tried to go on living without my heart. The only way I change is that the older I get, the more I love you. You're part of me, Pansy. I can't forget you. I used to wish once that I could. I'd have given anything to have been able to blot you out of my memory. I was a fool to think it possible. And then, when we met again, although there was Matherson and, and Buster, it made no difference. And I knew then how it would be always, to my death. She was quiet for a moment. Then she broke out again. But what can I do, Lynn? What can I do? Lately, it seems almost as if, as if Basil... No, he's been so cruel. This week when we were away, he felt her shudder. I can't tell you. Sometimes I think he hates me. Sometimes I think I hate him. I'm sorry for him, too. I don't believe he's any happier than I am. We're just tied together, both hating it. And we shall never be able to get away from each other, never. The words were a hopeless whisper, and they cut Ramsden to the heart. It was some moments before he could trust himself to speak. Then he said very gently, and we'll have to come to a choice, Pansy. You know that, don't you? We can't go on like this. It's impossible. I, I couldn't stand it. Even if you could, it's horrible to me. Having to meet you like this. His voice rose, 
rose passionately. If you wish it, I'll see Matherson tomorrow, and tell him the truth, and take you away. I can face the thing in the open, but to go behind a man's back! He momentarily lost his self-control. He began to plead brokenly. Come away with me. Life's so short, and we've got, we've all got the right to happiness. I've loved you so long, and you never cared for him. We'll take Buster and go abroad, where he can't find us. Pansy! I can't. Lynn, I can't. He'd find us. If he had to search every corner of the world, I know him and you don't. He'd take Buster away, and he'd be cruel to him to punish me. And I love him. He's mine, after all. It would break my heart. It must be him. Or me, Pansy, she cried out wildly. No, no, he held her closer. You do love me. You do want me. If I didn't, should I be here? My beloved. And you won't leave me. You won't grow tired of waiting. Oh, I know it's horrible. It's wickedly selfish. But I want you to go on loving me always. I shall love you to the end of my life and after whatever happens. Never anyone else. She felt his arms fall from about her. And she cried out in distress. Oh, Lynn, what is it? Lynn! He turned away from her, fighting hard for composure. My God, you can't ask me things like this when you know what I've suffered. I've been through hell since I knew you were Matherson's wife. He tried hard to control his voice. He went on more quietly. You see, until I knew you were married, I always had a hope that someday, perhaps. But now it's no good. Sometimes I think I've been half a mad pansy. Sometimes I felt that I wanted to kill Matherson for the way he spoke to you, the way he looked at you, the woman I love. Night after night, I've been over here, my, beside myself with misery, walking this garden like a crazy fool. This week, I went up to London. I haunted the hotel where I knew you were, just to see you. When? He laughed harshly. <laughs> it sounds mad, I know. Sometimes I think I'm mad, mad with love for you. And you ask me, will there ever be anyone else? Oh, my dear, I shall never leave you, never, unless you tell me it is your wish that I should go. That is the end of chapter 14 of The Matherson Marriage by Rubia Mayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope that you have a great day. Bye!